Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us stand and affirm the promise that relates to the door of our hope. Let the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this once again privilege to be in this place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. And so, allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted to heights higher than us and to break all burden and sin that binds us. In the name of Jesus Christ, may in this place be cursed as before all the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depression, destruction, stagnancy, all of this let it depart from the tents of your holy people. And stand, Lord, on the place of your rest, you and the ark of your greatness. And may your saints be clothed in your salvation, and may they rejoice before your countenance. Give us more from your Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and allow us to find your holy countenance. We thank you that this service is presented by Apostle Arkady into your divine arms, and we ask you to continue to guide it with your high and uplifted hand. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May you be blessed and you may be seated. Greetings, the Lord's people. I would like to pass on a greeting uh, from the also the children of God from Vilnius. Because the reason I say this is because what we have one heart, we have one mind. We receive the very same food from the very same wellspring that we trust. And we are achieving the same goals that you are achieving. We received just as you receive the promise that within our bodies the stronghold of life will be erected and the stronghold of death will be thrusted out into hell. And so we just like you together we are one the sermon that we will be looking at today is the sermon of our apostle uh, the 10th of October uh, year 2021 <clears throat> that you may be sons of your father in heaven for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. When our Apostle says this, either in this cycle of sermons, or that we need to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, and that we need to make, make it in our life uh, to put off, be renewed, and put on, and he says a very clear thing in this and the other cycle of sermons and that, that this is a commandment and this is a commandment which is an inheritance of saints of all times and the commandment is addressed by Christ strictly to his students and so many people can take a place of scripture read it and say yes it does look like it's in a commanding format <clears throat> but for this commandment to be followed you need to have specific statutes and so that we have statutes we need a an instructor that would be able to explain the statute how to follow the commandment you can try to follow it with your own intellect or the understandings of your own intellect making your intellect your own god as many carnal people do but there are people who clearly understood <clears throat> or understand that to follow such a commandment you need a teacher and you don't just need a teacher that is elected by the form of a vote <clears throat> as the scriptures say there are teachers that you elect so that they deceive you but here there needs to be a teacher that needs to be accepted it's one that you elect <clears throat> that would deceive you and there's another where you are subject to a specific authority, to a specific individual who is uh, given authority from God and he is able, using his lips, he proclaims the word of God. And so people 
who do not acknowledge over themselves the authority of a person that is sent by God have never had any part to the inheritance that is contained in this commandment, and it is doubtful that they will ever be able to. To acknowledge the authority of a person sent by God is fulfilling what he says. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so his messengers, they represent the interests of his commandments, the commandments of God. Relevant to fulfilling this required commandment, to be vigilant over the word of God within your heart as God is vigilant over his spoken word within the temple of our body, we stop to study the following question. What specific goals does the righteousness of God pursue that we are collaborating with within our heart? We talk about the word uh, collaborate quite a bit. We use it in many places. Let's see how the apostle identifies the word collaborate. To collaborate is to be vigilant over the word that we have concealed in our heart so that we give God the proper basis to be vigilant over that word that we have concealed within our heart. God is vigilant in the temple of our body. He's not vigilant over his word somewhere else. It's not abstract and it's not fit or put into some kind of abstract uh, area. He places his word in his house. He magnifies this word above all his name by the means of a person who sees and magnifies this word over all of God's names. And then God seeing this, he vi is vigilant over the word. He collaborates with this person. Only in this situation, God is vigilant in the situation when we're vigilant, when we hear the word of God and conceal it in our heart. Otherwise, the collaboration will not happen. And in part, we've been studying the purpose of the righteousness of God within our heart received by us in the two broken tablets of the covenant, where we, in the death of our Lord Jesus, died by the law, <clears throat> through the law for the law. We came out from under the guard of the law died through the law for the law, that means we came out of the guard of the law so that in the new tablets of the covenant that symbolize the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can receive justification so that we can live for the one that died for us and resurrected so that in this way we can obtain confirmation of our salvation in new tablets of the covenant symbolizing the resurrection of life so that we can provide God with the proper foundation to give us the promise to be heirs of peace, not by the past law, but by the righteousness of faith, similar to how he gave this promise to Abraham or to his seed. <clears throat> the book of Romans 4, 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. In other words, to be a, an heir of peace you can by the righteousness of faith. The covenant of peace in the heart of a warrior in prayer is the result of the obedience of, he, of his faith to the faith of God that is spoken by his delegated ones. The apostle says that God's faith, it comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. And so the faith of God within our heart represents uh, it's the general, it is, the, it is the, the lead, it is the one that leads the armies of the Lord. This is the name of the Lord of hosts. He leads these armies so that he can battle for our body, so that he can adopt them by the resurrection of Christ upon the condition that our faith will be as a warrior. Uh, what does our faith need to do? It needs to uh, wait with patience, with trembling, as soon as it hears the word of God, it immediately begins to fulfill this word and not thinking about what will happen after I receive this word. Possibly I may need to lose something. That is the very essence of it. It's possible I will need to uh, leave something or keep something. Every time we uh, receive the word of God, we do something, we pay a price, because it's not possible to receive not having paid a price. We lose something, because the word of God every time separates us from something and offers us something different or something we may need to keep. 
It may be valuable for the flesh, but perishing for the spirit. And so what we focus our eyes upon, the Lord says that this is your destruction. Don't pay attention to it. This is your death. You don't need this. This is not value, uh, valuable to you. To receive the word of God is always keep something, something to separate from and to die for something. And so by what signs do we need to examine ourselves that the peace of God rules within our heart, which identifies us as the sons of God and as the most holy of the Lord? The apostle says, it, what does it identify? What identifies it? It specifies within us uh, that peace of God. And by that peace, we can judge whether we are God's children or not. To examine your heart as to whether the peace of God is governing in it is possible by the ability to be a peacemaker. This characterizes us as the sons of God, as it is written. Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. There are a lot of uh, ideas of what uh, peacemakers are, but none of these ideas are not fundamental. They're not something that you can take and use as uses faith or apply as faith. It's the opposite. People who make up uh, def- meanings or definitions of a peacemaker, they try to apply uh, or create as if were uh, uh, enemies and then the, the peacemakers. And, but from uh, There will not be fruit from any of this. To be a peacemaker, you need to continuously lose something. How strange that may be. To have peace with a hus- between a husband and wife and wife and husband, they need to lose something. You need to compromise. Refuse your own personal interests for the benefit of the interests of the partner. But even in church, we are called, uh, to, when it comes to our neighbor, to reject our own interests, uh, refuse them for the benefit of the interests of our brother or sister. Look for the benefit of our brother. But if a person is looking for profit benefit for himself, uh, this is a dangerous situation. In a particular format, we already looked at six of the signs, the consistency of which allows us to judge and examine ourselves as to whether we are the sons of peace and furthermore the sons of God. And we stopped to study the seventh sign the seventh sign by which we need to judge that we belong to the sons of peace. And this is by our ability to clothe our body, our essence, into the holy or the selective love of God. And so, holy and selective love of God, there are a lot of copies for this. Some people say that God's love is tolerant. Some say that God's love the, another person will say something different, the third will say something different, but let us look at what the Apostle says, the wellspring that we trust. Holy is something that separates us from something. A selective is what, selective is holy. Holy, selective, they are uh, synonymous. If God did not love everyone in general, he would not be holy. His love would not be selective but tolerant To be tolerant towards sin is not something you need to do or confuse. Colossians 3, 14, 15. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule within your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. The Apostle identifies further, it's talking about the fact that we are called to be in one body with the very same saints who are a part of the body of Christ. And so those that are within Jesus Christ. If you are the body of Christ, then you are in Jesus Christ. Because the church is the body of Christ, he is the head. And how do you place yourself into him? Into Jesus Christ. It is to place yourself in the church which corresponds the requirements of the virtuous wife. There are also a lot of uh, different interpretations of how to place yourself into Jesus Christ. 
people think about how they need to walk in Jesus Christ and even show this on this, demonstrate things on the stage, but these are just the works of the mind uh, and nothing more. You need to place yourself into a church that corresponds the requirement of a, of a virtuous wife where we can receive God's favor. It is not in every church are you able to receive the Lord's favor. You need to understand that grace, it is obtained through the righteousness of heart. You, you don't obtain it in any other way. You don't purchase it. You obtain it by having a righteous heart. If in your church you don't teach how to uh, convert the seed of justification given to us as a guarantee so you can then receive it as a possession, as a fruit of righteousness, then you will never be under grace or the law of grace. You will just deceive others and yourself that you are under grace when you actually are under the guard of the law. People are under grace when they die for, to, for sin and they c- remain dead to sin because you can hear this much, I am under grace, but when you ask them how to explain, uh, ask them to explain uh, grace, they can't explain it. And so they say, well, this is where God allows you to do whatever and anything that you want because God paid the price and you give freedom to your old self, your desire uh, to do whatever it wants. People are under grace when they die to sin and remain dead to sin. How can you be under grace when you are living for sin? You are not able to battle with sin. You don't count yourself dead to sin and living for God. You with your lips don't confess the stronghold of life as an exist as something existing, although And so how do you consider then yourself under grace when you're under the guard of the law? I want to uh, bring forth one place of scripture. This is the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 3. Many saints read this place of scripture, and they just read it, read only the first part, but you actually need to read the entire Uh, three verses. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. This piece everyone reads, but no one wants to go further. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God that so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. This is something our pastor notes and shows us Take the word of God that you heard from my mouth, Pastor says, and begin, put it into your heart and then confess it with your with your mouth. This is faith. It is written about how God from the unseen brought forth what is seen, or from the invisible made the visible. The surrounding world was created this way. It was invisible and became visible. The word of God offers that we have that, that we see what it, faith is, is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We take and confess what may not literally be existing in the present, but it already is has been accomplished, exists in the Lord. Because we take the word of God, it has come to us, we have concealed it in our heart and have begun to confess it. In Scripture, the selective love of God is presented by the Holy Spirit in the light of seven unchanging virtues <clears throat> or components by the preached word spoken by his apostles and prophets that in essence are the unchanging virtues of God himself. The apostle <clears throat> says that in these qualities, these characteristics, we see the character of the Lord Jesus, the character of the Holy Spirit, and the character of the Father himself. We are presented with God's nature that we can be perfect because we have been born from the seed of the word of truth. <clears throat> we have everything so we can be so. <clears throat> but you need to obey yourself. Obey to, uh, you need to obey the word of God, obey his, his messenger, and grow yourself into the fullness of growth in Christ. <clears throat> obey your faith to God's faith so that you can grow and be uh, fully grown into in the fullness of the measure of growth in Christ. 
And so these are virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. These characteristics give us the ability to possess the nature of the Father, to be a partaker of His nature and open up the door to the kingdom of heaven. In a specific format of the seven given characteristics of virtue that united identify the goodness of God within our heart, we have already studied five of the characteristics and have been studying the sixth, and this is the calling to demonstrate the love of God agape within brotherly love. The presence of this great and noble component in demonstrating our faith moves us from the state, literally moves us from the state of eternal death into the state of eternal life. And the Apostle identifies this. He says that our spirit will will sense this, not our flesh. Our flesh will experience death. We will. It will appear that something's wrong because we've become used to judging according to the emotions. Is the Lord with me or not? Have I done something wrong or, or right? And uh, determine this looking at our own feelings. We need to not look at our feelings, but look at something different. I still have moments, of course, I'll have a, I'll wake up with, with a bad mood. That doesn't mean the Lord is against me. That doesn't mean I have committed a sin. I understand that in my body there's some kind of chemical changes that may be occurring, as every person has that. And I can wake up in a bad mood, but that doesn't change anything. Why? Because I know who the Father is to me in Jesus Christ, who I am in Jesus Christ to God, and I confess this, what He's done for me in Jesus Christ, and what do I need to do to inherit all that God has done for me. And I began to confess this with my mouth. Furthermore, you can go, you can take a psalm, a psalm that maybe often is uh is read or you like reading, I take the 22nd Psalm and I begin to proclaim who the Lord is for me and then I pray in tongues and then I read again from the Psalm and then I pray again in tongues and you will see and I think many of you have uh, behaved, beha- many of you behave this way that your bad mood leaves you and if it, and also sometimes when you feel like something's condemning you li- that that leaves and, and disappears And so when you have a bad mood, that does not mean that God has turned His face away from you. The Apostle says clearly we need to not look at our feelings, but the information. Faith is not our feelings. Faith is not what I feel, but what I know. Faith is information. We know in whom we have believed. We know that we have passed from death to life. We don't feel, we know. We know that we have passed from death to life. And we know this because this came from the preached words of our Apostle. This is 1 John 3, 14, 15. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer as eternal life abiding in Him. Relevant to this, as with the previous components of the virtue of God in His unique for us goodness, which we are called to demonstrate in our faith in seven components, we came to the necessity to study four classical questions. First question, what do the scriptures say about the power of brotherly love, which we are called to demonstrate in our faith? in the essence of God's love, which has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Second question, what purpose is the power of brotherly love called to fulfill, which is testimony of the fact that the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Third question, what conditions do we need to fulfill so that we receive power to demonstrate brotherly love in our faith, which is testimony of the fact that the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. In a specific format, we already looked at the first these first three questions and have been studying question four. By what signs can we examine ourselves as to whether we <clears throat> whether we are demonstrating brotherly love in our faith, which 
is testimony of the fact that the love of God has been poured into our heart by the Holy Spirit who is given to us as the first sign by which we are able to by which we are able to judge that we are demonstrating the power of the love of God agape within brotherly love within our faith has already been the subject of our study in the previous services we will immediately begin the study of the second the first sign let us just read it that by which we need to demonstrate that we are demonstrating the power of brotherly love in our faith can be determined by our ability to judge the cause of the poor and needy upon the foundation of the law of righteousness. The second sign by which we need to examine ourselves as to whether we are demonstrating the power of brotherly love in our faith, which is testimony that the love of God has been poured into our heart by the Holy Spirit who is given to us, is the absence of the organ of stumbling within our heart. And when the uncircumcised ear hears this organ of stumbling, they'll say, this is some kind, something made up. Let us uh, look at what this is. The apostle says that this is not just a quality and characteristic. This is an organ of the flesh, the old man. This is an organ of the flesh, the old man, stumbling. We will keep in mind that love to God, which we are called to demonstrate within our faith and the power of brotherly love, consists in our voluntary obedience to the Word of God in all of its formats and in all of its hypostasis. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. This is as a result. Those who love his law have great peace, and the result is nothing causes them to stumble. Lord, I hope for your salvation, and I do your and I and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. Psalm one nineteen one sixty five through one sixty eight. Considering the fact that no one has ever seen God except for the Son of God, that has the virtue of the Son of Man. He demonstrated the qualities and the character of his Father, as well as his grace, that pursued good goals in the service of our justification. We can love God only by loving his creation, and by researching his commandments and his statutes spoken by the mouth of his messengers, that are established within our heart in the format of the made covenant of peace with God with his creation. To love God... Some say, I love God, and they show their feelings, I great, I love Him very much, but show how you love Him. And so by studying His commandments and His statutes, and we do this by listening to the words of His messengers, this is not talking about feelings. Feelings are good, as our Apostle says, feelings are good. Uh, are good wood, but only when they're burning in the right place, but when they're burning... Uh, ahead of the information or before the information that you have that means it will lead and you will follow what 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 it wants or they want because specifically the words that come out of the mouth of God it is by this word that came out of the mouth of God that the visible and invisible was made and specifically by the law of his word is how God keeps the visible and the invisible as it is written first uh, John 4 20 21 If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. It is by the demonstration of the love of God agape to our brothers that possesses the virtue of our neighbor. Not all people are God's creation. There are a few people that are actually God's creation. There are many called, but but there are many called, but few are chosen. And so these called, they are not God's creation. Jesus said to the religious elite, you you are your father, of your father, the devil. You are the devil's creation because you do his desire, his will. God's creation are people who fulfill not their desires, but God's desires. These are people who die for their desires 
so that they can satisfy or fulfill God's desires. Specifically demonstrating this love of God agape to our brother, as we see here that they possess the virtue of our neighbors, we receive the ability to demonstrate the power of brotherly love within our faith, which is testimony of the fact that the love of God has been poured into our heart by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Apostle says that our brothers who possess the quality of our neighbor who are in the midst of our churches to whom we are called to demonstrate the power of brotherly love in the format of the love of God agape our brothers can only be those people that possess the status of a stranger the fatherless and widow within their heart the qualities that we ourselves have for they are not all Israel who are of Israel nor are they <clears throat> are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham Romans 9 6 7 not all are the children of Abraham because they were born uh, physically uh, from that line genetic line the sign that is being studied by us in one of the phrases of the 119th psalm of david is the longest chapter in the bible it contains 176 verses however in the original hebrew language the 119th psalm is written in the form of an acrostic in the order of the letters of the hebrew alpha alphabet and contains 22 verses each verse has eight lines and each line begins with the same letter with this, each verse sings about the Word of God using metaphoric words like the law, judgments, commandments, regulations, orders, rulings, ways, and revelations. And what goal, this goal of, of, of the Psalm of David, it is to magnify this goal of this greatly artistic, poetic Song of David consists in us being able to sing and magnify the Word of God that abides within the temple of our body above all the names of God as all of the names of God are opened up and are known within our heart by the Word that comes out of the mouth of God that we are able to hear exclusively coming from the mouth of God's delegated people. Second, the goal of the song is to show the originality or the prime of the Word of God his rule and his crushing power and the authority when it comes to all that is visible and invisible. Third, the goal of the song is to demonstrate how we need to treat the word of God that is being preached by God's delegated people. Fourth, the goal of the song is to show the foretold and not foretold results that come from the right <clears throat> or the wrong treatment to, uh, of his word. We need to immediately note that in the given psalm, it is referring to the greatness of peace, which is called to be in the heart of man a sign of the covenant of peace that is made between us and God, that places responsibility upon both sides of the covenant. And if one of the sides violates the agreement of the covenant of peace, and the only side that can violate is the side of man, then the other side being God is then freed from the responsibility of fulfilling his part of the agreement in the covenant of peace. Responsibility in the covenant of peace that a person has bound himself with and in which he needs to continue and that he has promised to keep from disturbance of the interpretations of his carnal mind consists in him needing to love God in his living word and he has delegated this he had delegated to his messengers and made them his lips. And such a love of man for the law of God is called to reveal itself in the collaboration of his faith with the faith of God, in a voluntary and strict obedience to the law of God spoken by God's messengers. However, to understand the quality of the nature of stumbling, by the absence of which we, can, we are able to judge that we love the law of God, with which we are bound with, in a covenant of eternal peace and that we are called to demonstrate in our faith in the power of brotherly love, it is necessary for us to also identify the quality of great peace that comes from God as well as the quality of greatness of the law of God, or more specifically our love for the law of God, which is called to demonstrate itself in obedience to the law of God that keeps us within the boundaries of the covenant of peace that has been made between us and God. 
the scriptures ascribe love for the law of God to the category of good works or the category of the works of God. Many Christians, they try to uh, do good work and they imagine that good work is work that comes from their flesh. Maybe like walk an elderly person across the street, give maybe a poor person uh, something, food or money, maybe help someone in the church, but and so they think just these deeds are works of faith. Often these people prioritize evangelism, they think this is the main and most important good work that they do, but the scriptures uh, ascribe uh, the good work as the will of God. This gives God the right or the, the right foundation to erect His law in the temple of our body in the format of the stronghold of life as well as clothe our body into the power of His great peace that identifies the format of the law of God. It gives God the legitimate foundation, our good deeds that comes from our flesh. These don't give God the proper foundation and those who behave this way are just simple dreamers or loved or they love to uh, fantasize or imagine the apostle says that the children of god stumble upon revelations they say how can we understand this i don't agree with this they stumble upon the messengers of god who carry these revelations love for god that reveals itself in obedience to his law in the power of brotherly love gives God the right foundation to fulfill his part of the given covenant of peace so that the imperishable covenant of peace can be erected in our mortal body in the form of the stronghold of eternal life therefore stumbling that is discovered in man is testimony that the given person does not love God in the words of his law that establishes peaceful relations with God with one another and with all of the world. Let's look at what stumbling is in Hebrew. There's a clear, uh, clear definitions of what stumbling is. Grievance or resentment, temptation, defeat, barrier that stands between man and God. This is rejecting your good conscience, a shipwreck in faith, a deadly sore, a snare of the devil, a trap of the devil, and nets of the devil. And if you ask a person, a Christian, what an organ of stumbling is, he will not be able to describe this. But by the questions he asks, you can easily determine if he has an organ of stumbling. And so when someone says, why do I need to go to church? Uh, when he he, he asks uh, the question, meaning that he doesn't want to, then you can tell that this he has an organ of stumbling in him. There needs to be one wellspring that you trust. And so when someone says, how can I just listen to one person? This is an organ of stumbling. You have not trust entrusted yourself in the hands of God. You have not Uh, humbled yourself under a teacher this is an organ of stumbling then it's also talking about a covering they say well Christ is my pastor but they don't read that uh, Jesus is the uh, lead pastor and so when someone says I have my own Bible uh, this is also an organ of stumbling I have my own mind my own opinions this is also an organ of stumbling how do, and or when you hear expressions, uh, how do I proclaim the not existent as existent, uh, spoken in a form of di- of disagreement? These are organs of stumbling. But you can you can get rid of this organ, but only with the old man. And when you start trying to get rid of the old man in yourself, these people don't want to. According to the findings of Scripture, a person is stumbling <clears throat> on the words of God and the character of God most of the time for the reason that he does not know God and has not gotten to know God in his words. For the simple reason that his God, 
is actually his intellectual abilities that he trusts upon, that he burns incense to as his God, and by the means of which he is trying to interpret the scriptures and differentiate good from evil. Proverbs 28, 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Pastor identifies what walking wisely means. This is to follow the footsteps of the flocks. Hear the word, trust this word, and not try to interpret it with your own personal intellect. Follow the footsteps of the flocks who follow the voice of their shepherd and tend their tend your little goats in the format of your pure mind beside the shepherd's tents so that you would not that you not pervert your pure pure form of thinking or your pure mind tell me oh you whom I love where fe- where do you feed your flocks and the desire where he feeds his flock so that you, she can be there he is a shepherd he he feeds his flocks and we need to know where where he is Where do you make it rest at noon? For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? If you do not know, fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats besides the shepherd's tents. Songs of Solomon 1, 7, 8. And there, of course, you will meet me, is what he's saying, and will be able to find rest. Who are these shepherds who live in tents? This identifies God's messengers that have died for the elements of the world in the form of their nation and became strangers and wanderers on earth living in the tents of the shepherds. The apostle says that if we tend our our thoughts, then we are strangers or wanderers. But in the church there needs to be one shepherd because each one can say, well, Pastor, my pastor is Jesus, and I have my own thoughts. We need to have one pa- one shepherd, and and there are the tents where we can go and find rest at, at noonday. The tent of a shepherd is a tent of a wanderer or a pilgrim who is searching for green food for his sheep, roams from one pasture to the next at the same time the green pastures upon which the shepherd roams seeking food for his sheep are the promises of God. Therefore to follow in the footsteps of the flock is to follow the voice of the person that is clothed into the authority of the delegated fathership of God that God has placed over us. Without the collaboration of our obedience with the word of this person, we will not be able to inherit any promises that have been placed by God upon our account in Jesus Christ. For all of the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen. For all of the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. Second Corinthians 1.20 To feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents is to obey the revelations of their word and look at their form of life. You, you know, when when I used to read uh, that we need to look at the end of, of, of God's uh, holy people, And I always thought that I have to actually wait till the end of their life to watch to see how they end their life to be able to follow this what they do. But this is not so. And so <clears throat> in Scripture it says, looking at how they end their and their days, look at their faith. <clears throat> and so meaning the kind of life they live. And it's not talking about that they have to finish their life, but specifically the goals that they have and where they lead God's holy nation is really what you need to focus on. To look at their form of life that is called to be in accordance to a wanderer or a stranger and a widow upon this earth. If your pastor does, is not such a shepherd, does not have these qualities, you need to leave such a church and ask the Lord that he direct you to uh, where the tents of a shepherd are 
so that you can find your narrow gate where you would be able to be uh, placed into Christ. If we refuse to follow the voice of the person to whom God has trusted the revelations of His Word, and we refuse it because we choose to rather uh, listen to our own personal interpretations of what what is good and what is evil, then this means that we are foolish and we do not have love for the law of God. If we did, God would have been able to build a peaceful relationship with us due to which our heart would not have had this organ of stumbling. Your ways and your doings have procured these these things for you. This is your wickedness because it is bitter, because it reaches to your heart. O my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is plundered. Suddenly my tents are plundered, and my curtains in a moment. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are silly children, and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. Jeremiah 4, 18-22 We can conclude that a person that trusts upon his own intelligent abilities when it comes to interpreting scripture is not able to love the law of God and is not able to have the peace of God within his heart. Because of this, such a person stumbles upon his neighbor as well as upon the person who is the head of the church. And this person will fault God for all of this, thinking that if God was loving and just, then he would not have allowed such injustice to occur in his own life. Therefore, the organ of stumbling in a person is his personal opinions or his fleshly state, where he, instead of judging himself, he judges God and his neighbor. Therefore, this contrary peace upon which a person trusts within his heart because of his personal opinions and for the benefit of which he rejected instruction in faith as this instruction did not fit his point of view and therefore God became a stumbling block to him and his neighbor became a stumbling block to him. The Apostle says that Reading in the book of Isaiah, For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of his people, saying, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. What do people in the church, uh, what are people uh, in the church afraid of today? And so, at this time, when this sermon was was uh, said, they were afraid of the virus at that time, when it just started. And they were so afraid, and they, and they stopped all their services because they were so afraid, due to fear. But you may say, well, we also didn't come, but we were being sanctified. Pastor, uh, the Lord revealed to him that we need to utilize that time that time frame to sanctify ourselves as Elijah did when the Lord led him into the wilderness where we needed to again become familiar with God's law with the teaching of Jesus Christ and his 12 foundations and the prayers the principles of prayer what prayer is and how we need to pray and when we did this in solitude we again gathered and now this virus is even worse but in our hearts there's peace and calm, and we are not afraid. For the Lord spoke, The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow, let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense to both the house of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many among them shall stumble, they shall fall, and be broken, be snared, and taken Isaiah 8 11 through 15 and so these people who ex- imagine for themselves that God's love is tolerant that God loves everyone in general without any condition his love has absolutely no conditions he loves it turns out he also loves the sin in man is what they say 
they obviously don't read this place of scripture that uh, God will be a uh, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They say that there are some places of scripture that actually need to we need to get rid of is what they say, like the book of Luke. Uh, they say we need to take it out the the books of Apostle Paul we also need to pull out that that as if Paul made up these stories that he made met with Jesus for them it's not fitting and they want they they avoid these these uh, books and places of scripture according to the to the revelations of scripture uh, the initiator of stumbling is God, who allows it to happen in the heart of a person as a form of vengeance. Because they do not fear the Lord, they are afraid of death and illness and, and famine, and they're afraid of new viruses that are coming out. According to scripture, this is just the beginning. If you can imagine for yourself, when there will be even more terrible viruses that don't have vaccines and that will destroy people. What will these people do then? Some not having the fear of the Lord or some having this idea that, oh, if Jesus walked on <clears throat> walked on water, I'm going to do it the same. Um, and then they obviously will drown. If you remember Peter Peter had told Jesus, if you're not a not just a, a ghost or allow me to walk upon the water, and Jesus told him to come, but he lacked in faith at the moment. And so if it is you, he said to Jesus, allow me to walk, and Jesus said, come. And so this word was key. When he said, come, this was that foundation upon which Peter, uh, he, 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 he relied upon to, to walk upon the water but when he started to look not upon Jesus or the word that he had received but upon the waves then he began to drown and and he shouted Lord help me Jesus immediately appeared next to him pulled him out as if he's standing upon firm ground when you have the word of God inside which you have concealed it's such a uh, strong foundation when you look upon it the storm where these people will be drowning that do not look at the word of god but look at what they feel what they what happens in politics they're the ones that will be drowning in the storm the apostle says that he looks at what happens in politics but not to make conclusions uh sp in spiritual but only just seeing the time uh, signs of the times and he says, I'm seeing that we're coming to, an, to, to near to the end. According to the revelations of scripture, as we said, the initiator of stumbling is God, who allows it to happen in the heart of a person as a form of vengeance because of the absence of love for God's laws. And such vengeance in the form of stumbling will be a barrier and a snare and a noose. And so this vengeance in the form of stumbling will be a barrier, a snare, a noose, and a net for this person in his ability to realize salvation that is given to him by God. Romans, 4, uh, Romans 11, 7 through 10. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, to this very day. Imagine, it is not them themselves, but God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see. When people say God is tolerant toward everyone, but here it says, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. Romans 11, 7 through 10. 
stumbling upon the path to the law of God as a result of the absence of the love of love for the law of God. At the same time, the absence of stumbling upon the path to the law of God is a result of love for the law of God that reveals itself in the desired fulfillment of God's given law. Due to, due to this fact, without an identification and understanding of the virtue of the law of God, its purpose and its conditions, giving us the right to know the virtue of this law, it is not possible to love the law of God. And consequently, it is not possible to be clothed and abide in the atmosphere of the great and perfect peace of God. This is because love for the law of God is not an emotional attraction and not a particular dependence upon our feelings. But this is a discipline of the renewed mind and the will of man. This, again, is not feelings. I love the word of God. I love it. You may hear this expression. But here it is written that this is a discipline of the renewed mind and the will of man. This is placed that are placed in dependence of the wise heart, where the two great witnesses are that stand before God of all the earth in the form of the Thummim and the Urim. Thummim, the teaching of Christ, Urim, the Holy Spirit, who reveals this teaching in the heart of a person. The book of John, 14, 15, 6, 14, uh, 15, 17. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be <coughs> in you. And so it seems simple, if you love me, keep my commandments, and so you may, you will here, people say they love God in their songs, in their, in their poems, and, but this doesn't necessarily mean it's love for God. Love for God is keeping His commandments, and to keep His commandments, you need a teacher that would be able to teach you the statutes of how to fulfill the commandment. The Apostle teaches us that uh, this is Jesus who was praying. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Why is it when something happens, people lose their peace? They speak in tongues, but they have no peace. The fact that you have tongues and you have no peace, if you would have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you would have peace uh, amongst trials and, and difficult times. And these difficult, difficult times would not be able to uh, drown the peace that you would have inside. And this peace, again, is literally the Holy Spirit within you, whom you can receive when you follow God's commandments. And following the commandments, we at this time will not feel something pleasant or blissful inside. We actually, fulfilling God's commandments, may experience uh, difficulty we uh, stop or or get in the way of things that may be uh, going on inside, and this may be uncomfortable. Lusts and desires we may have, not feeding our flesh or our, our lusts. And so anyone who feeds them, their flesh becomes strong. Why is it many that watch pornography become weak spiritually and God abandons them? Because they feed this lust and this lust becomes more evil. The Apostle says that he knows specific people that die in this lust and are not able to be free of it. Why? Because they don't follow God's commandments. If it says, do not watch, do not walk, do not go, do not communicate, communicating with such people, this is the evil company that corrupt good habits. And this person who is communicating with them does not see that this is evil company. And because of this, uh, he can't produce uh, good fruit. To follow the commandments that identify the law of God and are the given law of God means to desire to know the commandments with your heart, to quench the hunger and thirst of the heart with God's commandments, 
to fulfill God's commandments, to keep the commandments within your heart, to be within the commandments, to meditate about the commandments, to look at the commandments, not go out of the boundaries of these commandments, not peddle with and not belittle the commandments, to be vigilant on guard of the commandments, not bring... I, I, bring in idols within the boundaries of the commandments, be delivered from the chaff of the flesh by the commandments, to treasure the commandments as an imperishable treasure. I will remind us that ignorance in knowing the law of God is incriminated in Scripture as resistance to God's law. And love for the law of God, identified as abiding in the law by obeying this law, serves as a guarantee for us that we are within the boundaries of the great peace of God and a guarantee that we will be raptured and we will meet the Lord upon the clouds. The Apostle reminds us about the heavenly clouds. Paul says when this will happen and we will forever be this way with the Lord. Imagine the church of the first sheaf they have already put on their new bodies together with Christ, they left. Imagine if he would not have fulfilled his word and would have abandoned them, but just himself would come here to take us. This would not have been able to happen. He would not violate his word. When he says, you will come to me, I take you and you will forever be with me. And so the Apostle says that the Holy Spirit has revealed that great meeting with Christ will not just be with Christ, but with this first sheaf that uh, and the second day of the Passover, the first sheaf was brought to the Lord, and this was a symbol of the, of the rapture of that first sheaf. And on the clouds, we will meet with David, Abraham, that people actually stumble upon these people. We will meet with all of the prophets, the prophets of the Old Testament. We will meet with all of the godly uh, Jewish kings. We will meet with Adam because God brought him into the right state. We will meet with all of these people, all these patriarchs that had come from Adam. And this will be a very surprising greeting. But those that die together with us here, or before us, or during our time, they will be resurrected first, and together with them, then we will be raptured and united with this first sheaf. And when we reach these clouds, and in the clouds we will disappear, this will be like a different realm that we will be in. And he, sa- he says this is a revelation that he received. The first book of John 2, 28, 29. And now little children abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him in his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And this is not all. Love for the law of God that clothes us into the great and perfect peace of God is also a guarantee that we will have an absence of all nature of stumbling being a barrier to us in achieving our salvation. Every law, and in this situation the law of God, identifies the moral virtue of its lawgiver. Pursuing a goal with this law that is linked to keeping a specific order that is within the boundaries of his word, where he rules for which he carries responsibility for before himself. Therefore, the boundaries that the Lord governs in and that he carries responsibility for before himself is the word that comes out of his mouth, with which he has created the visible and invisible and with which he keeps the visible and invisible. And to demonstrate governance of his law in the temple of our body, it is necessary to ratify this law by the chosen by him nation, making a covenant with him upon Sinai. And such ratification took place upon Mount Gerizim and Ebal, 
When Israel, by the command of God through Moses, proclaimed from the heights of these mountains the words of curse and words of blessing, confirming each blessing and each curse with the word, Amen. The teaching of blessing and cursing contains the character of the teaching of Christ that is reflected in the selectiveness of the love of God where he loves the vessels of mercy and hates the vessels of wrath. With this, we need to keep in mind that it isn't God, but people themselves, not God, but people themselves that have made themselves either vessels of mercy or vessels of wrath. This is the choice of man. The vessels of mercy are people that have loved his law. The vessels of curse or wrath are people that have hated his law and have resisted his law. And such resistance for the law of God expresses itself in that these people declare his statutes and take God's covenant in their mouth, but themselves hate his instructions that are preached by God's messengers and cast the words of his law behind them. The apostle says why they hate it, because they interpret with their mind. And they say, but this is not how we understand it. The Apostle brought forth one example, I will shortly bring it to. He says that a pastor once approached our, our pastor and <clears throat> and he read a place of scripture, our pastor, and that uh, drunkards and, and fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, the the and so our pastor he was in this church, uh, in this our pastor was in a church of this other pastor. And so as soon as he finished speaking, our pastor, their members came to their pastor, the the existing pastor in their church, and said, "See, we caught him on a lie because he said uh, drunkards and fornicators. Uh, they he put them in one in one category, uh, and said that they will not inherit the kingdom of God." But their pastor told them he wasn't interpreting, he actually read it directly from the Bible. It wasn't needed to be interpreted, it was just read directly. But they said, but this is not how we understand it. But even if it's written, we here don't understand it like that. We have our Bible, we have our own mind. And this pastor says, I also drink wine, not our apostle, but the pastor in, in whose church our pastor is visiting. He says, I drink wine. And he knew that if he doesn't do something about it, he will also not have the kingdom of heaven. This pastor, that was the pastor of that local church. Because his members, if you recall here, that he called, they called our pastor a heretic. And it wasn't our pastor who was a heretic, but the one, who, but they were the ones heretics that were saying it wasn't a sin. Because they take what is deception and say it's the truth. <clears throat> or they take the truth and call it deception. And so the question, what kind, where will this church lead you if you attend? that kind of church remember again pastor read directly from the text it wasn't and so parables uh, different uh, allegories these need to be uh, interpreted but they to benefit their flesh they, they ju try to justify the fact that they don't understand it like that but to the wicked God says, What right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing that you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. 
Psalm 50, 16 through 21. To cast the words of the Lord behind you is to pervert the preached word to, to benefit your whims and your desires, just as these people did in the example Pastor gave. People who love the law of God say of themselves, I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. In other words, I will not watch pornography. I per a perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. I, that means I won't communicate with him or have fellowship with him. Psalm 101, 2-5 And as our time is already up, if I have the opportunity, I will continue uh, further in the next uh, uh, Tuesday service. Right now we will pray. Blessed Lord, God Almighty, the God of the spirits of all flesh, the great and mighty God, eternal God, you are the only one and the wise one. We come to you because of the blood of the covenant, the blood of Christ, and we thank you for the righteousness, justification, for the word, for the blood, for the Holy Spirit, for your mercies that you give to us because of Jesus Christ. Because of your goodness and severity, we thank you that our names, they're written into the book of life, the book of the Lamb, because you have seen us in Jesus Christ and have presented us before yourself, holy, upright and without guilt, wise and perfect, kings and priests, heirs, heirs with Christ. We thank you for this exceptional opportunity to know you because of your word, your height and your depth, your width, your length, so we know and may comprehend the love of Christ, which is beyond the typical intellect of man to be filled with all of your fullness. Our Father, may upon us and be fulfilled upon us all the things that you have purposed, your blessings and your goodness, and may curses come upon the enemies of our soul and be upon them. We will walk in your light as you walk in your light and we will have fellowship with one another and the love of Je the blood of Jesus Christ your son may it wash us from all our sins may we be salt and light our great father we thank you because you have adopted us we are purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ may within our body the stronghold of life be erected and the stronghold of death be thrusted out we thank you that because of the words of our apostle we were able to receive the presented to us order and your theocracy and we are not in a democratic structure where each one has his own personal opinion and elect for themselves teachers that would deceive them but we are within your godly theocracy we thank you that we were able to because of your word obtain righteousness in the broken tablets of the covenant and in the new tablets the resurrection of Christ, we receive justification. Our Father, we thank you that because of the preach to us word, we were able to uh, obey our faith to your faith. We have become sons of peace, sons of God, and because of this we have entered into the covenant of peace. We thank you that we learn to confess the faith of our heart and proclaim the not existent as existent because this is already fulfilled in you. It's already a reality. We thank you for the ability to clothe our body into the holy and selective love of God. <clears throat> we thank you for the calling to demonstrate in brotherly love your love, agape, for the opportunity to uh, look at the work <clears throat> of the poor and needy and defend the fatherless, defend the innocent and condemn the guilty. Thank you that we don't have this organ of stumbling inside because you have taught, it, taught us through your apostle to love your law and we don't ha have stumbling because of it. We thank you for all of these blessings with which you have mightily blessed us. 
may we bring forth good and wonderful fruits. Amen and amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.